Let us pray. Our God will bless your name because we are here today again to study your word. We know it is the study of your word that makes the believer strong. Removing us away from the darkness of ignorance and giving us stability and steadfastness as the light of your word comes into us. Father, we are asking that this very day again, you will help us as we go a step further in the study of the word of God. Build us up. Keep us growing. Keep us strong in your word and definitely committed to the task you have given us to do. In Jesus' name, we pray. We have been spending time to look at the life and the ministry of Stephen. Just a deacon in the early church, but he was a great leader because of the great influence in his life, both in the church and among people that were outside the church. For some weeks now, we have seen him as he was in the church, a man greatly respected in the church, chosen and selected to be one of the seven that ministered with other people. But then we have not only seen him in the church, we have seen him outside the church, one as a soul winner and an effective evangelist. He competently, consistently showed the people that this Jesus is the Christ. And his ministry or ministration became so effective that some people were converted, no doubt. Then there were opposition raised up. And then the devil got the enemies stirred up. And false witnesses came against him. These false witnesses wanted to stop his message because his message for them was too convicting. It was getting too near their hearts in conviction. Therefore, they wanted a way to stop him. To do that, there was a fake trial. And they were giving him a hearing. Now, in chapter 6 of Acts of the Apostles, you see in verse 10, they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. And it is so wonderful to know that the same Holy Ghost that worked mightily in Stephen is available for every one of us. But listen to me, there is a price to pay. To have the Spirit of God in the same measure as Stephen had upon his life, to be so close to the Lord, to the point that nobody will be able to resist the spirit and the wisdom by which you speak, there is a price to pay. No doubt you'll need to give yourself to the reading of the word of God, to the study of the word of God, until like Stephen, you are saturated with the word of God. Now, you must wonder, as you read the message of this man in Acts chapter 7, he must have been so deep in the word of God. You know people that walk with dye, they dye clothes. And all the time they are dying clothes, their, their hands are so much all the time in the dye that their hands never are able to retain the original color. The dye just remains permanent in their hands. It's like that when you spend hours and hours and hours in the word of God all the time. You become so full of the scripture, so saturated of the scripture and the knowledge and the wisdom and the light of the scriptures they just have a permanent influence and impact upon your life that you never remain the same so it was with stephen he must have been spending hours on the scriptures not only that he gave himself to praying you, you can see that because he manifested so great power unknown to the casual uh, attendant at the throne at the altar of God. I mean, somebody that just comes to the altar of God casually, once in a while, occasionally, he will not be able to have the power, the knowledge, the impact, the influence, the anointing that you see on Stephen. But you know, he was frequent at the altar of prayer. He woke up in the morning, he was praying. You, you can tell. In the afternoon, he was also making his request before God. In the night, even though he was even asleep, his soul was awake before the Lord. 
he was much in the scriptures he was much in supplication and then you can tell his commitments and submission to the lord was very very great and deep until the testimony we hear about him is that they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke now listen to me if that happened to a man who was not an apostle who was not a prophet originally who was not an evangelist originally who was not recognized as a pastor as a teacher originally but just a deacon you can tell them such a thing can happen to you if you'll pay the price get into the scriptures come before the altar of god always yield yourself and give yourself to the lord and be a man of prayer now the servant men that is the gathered men against him in verse 11 then the servant or hired men which said we have heard him speak blasphemous words against moses and against god and he stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council and set up false witnesses which said this man ceases not does not stop to speak blasphemous words against this holy place the temple and uh, the law for we have heard him say that this jesus of nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which moses delivered us and all that sat in the council looking steadfastly on him saw his face as it had been the face of an angel now this is a setting they accused him of four charges one they said he spoke blasphemous words against God. Two, they said he spoke blasphemous words against Moses, a great leader in Israel that lived long, long ago. They said he spoke blasphemous words against the law, the law given to, Mos to Moses and to be given to Israel. And then they said he spoke blasphemous words against this holy place, the temple for major things there were great charges and now they wanted him to answer to the charges in chapter 7 verse 1 then said the high priest are these things so now they wanted to question him as to is this true have you been such a heretic a religious left-handed person have you been speaking something wrong evil blasphemous against god against moses against the law against the temple now their faces were very very angry and if you're a preacher that is not full of the holy ghost if you're preaching you'll be watching the faces of the people and you'll never be able to give them the word of god you know he got his anointing from above and when they gave him the chance and they said now you answer what have you been preaching you've been preaching error now you tell us what you've been saying and the council were all looking at him and they were ready to kill him but there was no fear in him and there was no instability in him he was ready to defend the faith earnestly contending for the faith once delivered unto the saints now my lesson from this which i want to pass across to you is this if at the time of the former reign such a great power knowledge insight and such great anointing and unction and spirit and wisdom came upon a man in the time of the former reign do you know what power what light what knowledge what assurance do you know what conviction and truth will come upon a man in the time of the latter reign if at the time of the beginning of the church at the time of the planting the raising up of the church if such great power confidence faith 
miracle working power could come upon a man you know what will come upon a man at the time when we're waiting for the coming of jesus when the work is almost ending when we're expecting the latter rain of the holy ghost to fall upon people much much power should come upon the people of the church at the time of the latter rain but then again we must pay the price spend time in the bible in the word of god spend time reading this word of god now i've been showing you the message of this man stephen and this is the evidence of the holy ghost coming upon a man you know sometimes people want to know are you baptized in the holy ghost and you want to reply oh yes i've been baptized in the holy ghost because I speak in tongues that's wonderful but then when you come to a tight corner when you come to a difficult situation how much of the Bible do you remember because my brother my sister the long-term evidence the daily evidence of the baptism of the Holy Ghost is that when you are cornered up that Holy Ghost will rise up within you, the Spirit of Truth. And before you know what is happening, all you have heard before in the Bible, you are just relating everything out. Relating everything out. You know, if that is not happening, and we just say, well, I thank God I'm speaking in tongues. I thank God because I've been baptized in the Holy Ghost. You know, that experience will be questionable because the real evidence of the baptism in the Holy Ghost is that when you come into a tight corner, when you are questioned, the spirit of your father within you will speak through you. Not speaking in tongues now, just bringing out the word, the knowledge, the wisdom. And every word you say will be so weighty, the word of God will become a hammer in your mouth, breaking rocks in pieces. The word of God will become fire in your mouth, burning the chaff that's it when you are baptized in the holy ghost and you are questioned the spirit of your father within you will speak within you from you not only that you know what jesus said in john chapter 16 let me show you john chapter 16 verse 13 how be it when he the spirit of truth is come he will guide you into all truth for he shall not speak of himself but whatsoever he shall hear that shall he speak and he shall show you things to come you know when you are really baptized in the holy ghost and that spirit is upon you and within you that spirit is leading you and supporting you and guiding you and teaching you and enlightening you that spirit of truth the moment you open your mouth the truth of god hidden from the audience hidden from the people that are looking at you and listening to you that spirit of truth will just be bringing the truth out from you right into their hearts as the deep will be speaking and communicating with the deep how be it when he the spirit of truth has come he'll guide you into all truth and i want you to examine your testimony of being baptized in the holy ghost now in john chapter 14 verse 26 but the comforter which is the holy ghost whom the father will send in my name he shall teach you all things listen to this and he will bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever i have said unto you whatsoever i have said unto you now look up here have you ever seen a tailor sewing and he has a bundle of thread now you just uh, look at that bundle of thread wound up you don't know there is so much thread in that bundle and he just places it uh, somewhere 
and it connects it to the needle of the sewing machine. And you know, as long as it continues to operate the sewing machine on and on and on, that thread will just be coming out and coming out and that bundle will be rolling and rolling and rolling. You know what? The Holy Ghost in you. He, he brings out that thread of truth. You wouldn't know that so much of truth is inside you. You've been reading the Bible and you've been winding the thread of truth in that bundle right in your heart from Genesis, from Exodus, from Leviticus, from Numbers, from Deuteronomy, from Joshua, from Judges, from all those books of the Bible. You've just been reading and reading and reading and then all that thread is there just in a small bundle in your small heart and now you are called to question a council is calling you and challenging you and you know that um, bundle of thread the thread of truth it just connected to your needle to your mouth and you open your mouth and as you are talking that uh, thread is just coming out and coming out and coming out and people wonder and they call you a talking bible that it appears the whole of the Bible is inside your heart. Uh, you know what? When you are baptized in the Holy Ghost, really baptized, and you begin to talk, it says in this verse 26 that he shall bring to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. That's the office of the Holy Ghost. But you know, if we say we are baptized in the Holy Ghost, and the only thing we talk about is I talk in tongues, I speak in tongues, that's wonderful. But then it's not enough. Because that comforter, the spirit of truth, he walks with the truth. And he'll be teaching you all things. He'll be bringing to your remembrance whatsoever you have read before in the Bible, whatsoever you have heard before from the Bible, whatsoever you have heard in the word of God through the Lord Jesus Christ, that is it. He'll bring all those things to your remembrance. And now, this Stephen, obviously we can tell he was full of the Holy Ghost. Not that he was standing before the sinners and speaking in tongues. That's not the evidence. Number one, he manifested boldness. Boldness. That is it. I'm just telling you tonight that when we are full of the Holy Ghost, number one, number one, there will be that manifestation of power, unction, the spirit of God and faith. And when we stand to talk, there is no fear, there is no timidity in us, whatever. We just begin to talk without any shame, without any fear. Number two, the word of God that has been treasured up, stored up in your heart will just be coming out and coming out because that is a man that is full of the Holy Ghost. I want you to look at chapter 4 of Acts. Acts chapter 4. Verse 31, and when they had prayed, the place was shaken, where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. They were filled with the Holy Ghost. What was the result of that? The outcome of that? When they were filled with the Holy Ghost, see it in verse 31, and they speak the word of God with what? with what with boldness that is it when we're full of the holy ghost you don't have any problem remembering the word of god you have learned before you have read before when you are full of the holy ghost you don't have any problem standing erect and standing firm as the members of the choir told us fighting for the truth with boldness and if you are going to fight in that fight be on the firing line as they sang you must have that holy ghost within you that will give you supernatural boldness you see it in stephen he was bold he was bold so then you have learned something today being full of the holy ghost or being baptized in the holy ghost is not uh, just speaking in tongues every day that's wonderful don't misunderstand me that is wonderful but then you just have a saturation of the word of god you know that if somebody is baptized in the Holy Ghost, listen to me, he'll be so thirsty of reading the Bible, listening to the Bible, he'll be so thirsty of the Word of God, because he is the Spirit of Truth. The Holy Ghost we're talking about, listen to me, cannot operate properly, fully. 
to satisfaction where there is error because it's the spirit of truth. You find places where they're just uh, uh, pro uh, propagating error, falsehood, false doctrine, and they talk about Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost. Oh no, my brother, he doesn't work in such a place because it's the spirit of truth. And you know, when you are baptized in the Holy Ghost, there is a greater desire, greater thirst, and greater hunger for the truth of the Word of God. You want to search out that truth, drink in that truth. When the Holy Ghost is really upon you, then there will be boldness. And then when you are talking, all you have heard and learned and known before, everything will just be coming out of you. Now, let's look at this Stephen. Let's meet him fervent in business uh, you know sometimes you see a man of god and you meet him at the point where he's just relaxing he's not on duty that is he's not preaching uh, you meet the man of god when he's not praying praying for the sick or ministering uh, you meet a man of god a woman of god when she's not singing now listen to me when you meet a man of God, a woman of God, on duty, on the job, watch him properly. Have you ever seen a, a singer filled of the whole, full of the Holy Ghost and you see her, uh, you see him singing? Have you ever seen a real man of God who is given a ministry of music, singing or playing and just tears coming out? And, uh, you know, she forgets the crowd, she forgets the people, but the power of God, the anointing of God, the spirit of God, the unction from above is so much upon him, upon her playing or singing. And, you know, she is so singing the song and she's so caught up in the rapture of the glory of Jesus and she's just crying and singing at the same time. Have you ever seen that? I mean, when you see a man of God on duty, have you ever seen somebody? That, you know, casually, when you just meet a man of God who is, uh, you know, relaxing, not doing anything, whatever. But now, it's a man of God that prays for the sick or prays for the needy. And you see him on duty. When he's praying for the sick, you look at his face, you look at his appearance, you look at the unction, everything. And, and it's another man. He's not quite the man you knew before. When he was just casually sitting down. And the same thing when you see this man of God, Stephen, uh, you see him on duty. You see him on the job. And he's right standing up and he's preaching the gospel. They couldn't believe. They couldn't believe. He had no time to say, give me chance. Let me go and take my Bible. Oh no, that Bible was inside his heart. He had no time to say, let me go and take my outline. Let me go and prepare. Oh no, he had been preparing for years. And the Holy Spirit is now going to use this instrument in the hand of the mighty God. Now, let's watch him on duty. Those who are there. Those who are there. Now, look up here. Now, as, as I'm talking about Stephen, I, I don't want you to forget this. Because... He, we have been studying a sermon now for a number of weeks. You know what surprised me? All these false witnesses, they were rising up and they were talking at the top of their voices. And that man, at that time, Stephen was just relaxing and listening to them with a relaxed attitude. Maybe just sitting out somewhere. And all these people were so eager to accuse him and they were shouting on top of their voices, Oh yes, I heard him blaspheming God. I heard him blaspheming Jesus, uh, blaspheming Moses. I heard him blaspheming uh, the temple and the law. And now they said, What do you say to these things? Are these things so? And that man opened his mouth. And he started a long, long message. And everybody play, paid close attention. There was no usher. There was nobody to hush anyone and all those false witnesses when this man opened his mouth and he started talking the scriptures, there was dead silence. And everybody, they were just listening and there was a great, uh, a great attention they paid to what he was saying. Think about it. And nobody could raise his hand, nobody could raise his voice. This man was full of the Holy Ghost. How I am praying that those of us 
who are looking at the life and the ministry and the use of the gifts in the life of uh, Stephen. How I pray that God one day will give us a glimpse of his glory and his power will come upon us. And anywhere we stand up and we minister the word, the people will have no doubt in themselves that man talking is full of the Holy Ghost. And, and I believe that time is coming. Because you are not the same today as you were 12 months ago. Have you ever thought about that? You are not like you were this time last year. More of the thread of the truth has been wound up in your heart since last year. More of the power of the Holy Ghost, more unction, more understanding has come upon you since last year. And if Jesus tarries, if Jesus tarries, by this time next year, you are not going to be like you are today. And so as we get into the life and the ministry and the gifts in the life of this man, Stephen, I want you to understand, Stephen is gone. We are here. I'm looking for the time that God will raise up hundreds and thousands of Stephens among us in Jesus' name. And uh, he has answered uh, the question about God. They were satisfied. He had answered the question about Moses. And now he's going to talk about, about the law. But I, I told you last week, uh, this man was a fantastic preacher. Now he didn't go to Bible school. He's gone beyond Bible school. Uh, have you ever seen a Bible school, a preacher, a preaching? I doubt if you have ever seen one. You know, they, they know so much. They have so much of the knowledge in the library of the books that the fire of the Holy Ghost is not upon them. This man has never been to any Bible school. But he didn't know theology. Listen to me. This is not a normal English language. He knew neology. The theology of the knees. Not theology of the head, not knowledge that is carnal, knowledge that just gets into the brain, knowledge that you get from one-to-one -one discussion, conversation with the Almighty God. The knowledge you get when God wakes up, wakes you up in the night and He points you back to the Bible. The knowledge you get when you're on your knees in the early morning, in the early hours of the morning, and God is speaking to you and opening your eyes and opening your heart. The knowledge you get right there when you are praying and the Holy Ghost is just teaching you all things. And then the knowledge you get when you stand up in the power of the Holy Ghost and what is coming out of you is the distilled truth, the word of God without any error. Error. That is it. You know, some people go to seminary and they preach it as it appears. They are not coming from seminary but from cemetery. Everything is dead and cold, without fire, without power, without unction, without anointing. But you know, this man has not been to seminary or cemetery, but he has gone to the very altar of God. And at that altar of God, there was fire burning within his soul. And he started to talk and he saw his face. His face did not shine as the face of a professor, of a lecturer. His face did not shine as the face of a person that is big in the head and small in the heart. His face was shining as those angels of God who are all the time in the presence of the Almighty God. That's where he has been. That's why the face was shining like the face of an angel. And he looked at his face and he said, This one is beyond the normal, regular human being. The unction, the power was so much in the heart that it was overflowing of upon his face what a wonderful person Stephen was you know when you wait at the altar of God that is what happens to you now let's go on he had spoken about God he had spoken about Moses and now I come to the climax of his message I, I told you before it was an answer to the accusation but uh, do you know what his answer a turn from just answer just an address it had turned into a message. And now, perhaps he had forgotten that he was answering an accusation. 
Perhaps he had forgotten that the people that were before him, they were enemies of the gospel. He was now just giving them a message. And he comes to the climax. There's nothing like it. When you've been building up, you start with a low tempo. You start with a slow pace. And you are laying line upon line, line upon line, precept upon precept, precept upon precept. And then it appears the engine is hotter. The journey is smooth. And you just accelerate a little bit. And the Spirit of God takes over. And it just reaches a climax, a peak of the mountain in the message that he has developed. And the people were just shaking and trembling. And they were being convicted to the point they were reaching a breaking point. And just at that time, he gives them what they needed to hear. Now, let me read to you from verse 37. Acts chapter 7, verse 37. This is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear. Now, I told you before that Stephen is answering the charge they leveled against him. But then in answering the charge that he leveled against him, he was doing some other things. Number one, he was giving them the long history of the children of Israel. Very interesting history. And he liked to hear about themselves. And he used that to catch and to maintain their attention. Not only that, he was going to talk to them that Jesus Christ, the Lord, the Messiah, the Christ, he has come, he has gone, and you have missed him. And he did that in such a wonderful way. He did that, that you really needed to pay attention if you were there to understand what Stephen was doing. Because he told them about Joseph. He said, Joseph came the first time, they missed him. He told them they didn't know him the first time. When the brethren saw him, it was at the second time they knew him. And Moses showed himself unto those people the first time they missed him. It was when he came the second time they missed him. And you Jews and members of the council, you have been saying, Oh yes, we are not ignorant. If that Jesus of Nazareth is our Messiah, we shall know it. We would not have missed him. And he said, Are you sure of that? Are we not just following after the patriarchs and after the children of Israel? They missed Moses. They, they missed uh, jo uh, Joseph the first time. And Israel missed uh, Moses the first time. And you members of the council, listen to me. You have missed Jesus the second time. And those patriarchs, they saw, Mo they saw jo uh, Joseph. And they got him the second time and they bowed down. And when Moses came to them, after 40 years, they saw him the second time. They, they met him and they saw him, they accepted him. And you know Jesus will be coming the second time. And it's only after that second time you'll be catching it, you'll be understanding it. You'll be bending and bowing. He was telling them that, he didn't know what he was telling them. And now, uh, you know, they said uh, this temple is so great, this holy place. And you know that very cleverly. Stephen told them that uh, it was in the wilderness, at the backside of the desert, that God told the Moses, he said, remove your shoe from your feet because the place where you are standing is holy ground. Not the temple, not the tabernacle, everywhere the name of the Lord God is, everywhere the I am that I am is showing his glory and his power. That is the holy place. They didn't catch it, they didn't catch it, but he was telling them that you cannot restrict divinity, deity, the almighty. He is too great to be confined in a small place. And if you'll go back to the time of Moses, you will understand that every place that God is manifesting himself and his power, that is a holy place. Now he said, this Moses, which said unto, he said unto the children of Israel, a prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear. You know what he was telling them? He's saying, you are deaf. You have never heard Moses. You read the writings of Moses. 
You recite the writings of Moses. You tell about what Moses has said, but you are deaf. And he revealed their deafness. And he said, a prophet shall the Lord your God raise up like unto me. Him shall you hear. And he has come. That prophet like unto Moses. He has come. And you have missed him. Aren't you deaf? Are you really hearing? And he said, like unto me. And he wanted them to, to think back about Jesus Christ and about Moses. You know that Moses was born at a time when a foreign nation was oppressing the children of Israel. You know that Jesus Christ was born at a time when a foreign nation, the Romans, were oppressing the, the children of Israel the same, like unto me. You know that when, uh, when Moses was born, they were trying to kill all the little, little, little children so that Moses could be killed. You know that when Jesus Christ was born, they were trying to kill all the little children so that Jesus Christ would be killed like unto me. You know that when Moses was born and eventually it appeared he will not be alive, do you know that it was right in the court, in the palace of Egypt, that Moses was protected? Do you know that when those children were being killed, it was right in Egypt that Jesus Christ was protected? What is that? A prophet like unto me. Uh, do you know that when the Gentiles in Midian, when they received Moses, that was the time they rejected Moses by the children of Israel. Uh, will, you, will you kill me like you killed somebody yesterday who has made you a ruler and a judge over us? Now the Gentiles received him, but the Jews rejected him. Do you know that Jesus Christ, while he was rejected by the Jews, the Gentiles received him? Uh, you know, if they were just looking at their scriptures, they will know this prophet had come, Jesus Christ, a prophet like unto me. Now Peter told them that before as well. In Acts chapter 3, reading from verse 22, For Moses truly said unto the fathers, a prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every one which shall not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Where did Moses say that? Deuteronomy chapter 18. Deuteronomy chapter 18. Verse 15, the Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee. Of thy brethren like unto me, unto him ye shall hearken. Unto him ye shall hearken. Matthew. Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17, verse 5. While he yet speak, behold, the bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud, which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. That's the prophet. Moses talked about him. That a prophet shall come. He'll be like unto me. When he comes, whatsoever he will tell you, hear ye him. If he tells you the gospel and he superimposes the gospel over the law, hear ye him. If he abolishes the law and he sets up the gospel, hear ye him. If he does not talk about law and he talks about grace, hear ye him. If he does not talk about the sacrifices but he talks about the lamp of God, hear ye him. If he says this is the blood of the New Testament that is shed for the remission of your sin, Hear ye him. If he says, believe on me and you will never perish, just hear ye him. Because that is the one that is coming. And to know him, he'll be a prophet like unto me. Born at a time when the nation is, when the nation is under foreign rule and foreign oppression like I was born. Born at a time when the little children will be killed like the little children were being killed at the time I was born. And being rejected by the Jews and accepted by the Gentiles. Hear ye him, hear ye him. But you know, those people, they were deaf. And Jesus said so before he left in Matthew chapter 13. 
Matthew chapter 13, verse 15. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them. Now, in Acts chapter 7, Acts chapter 7, he did not only talk to them about their deafness, he talked to them about their disobedience. And now Stephen, while he was answering the charge that he leveled against him, that he had blasphemed against the law and against the temple, he's now going to take the area of the law up. And, uh, you know, this uh, Stephen, uh, when you get to heaven and you see him, uh, you will not see just his face shining with the face of an angel. You will see him in glorified body. And uh, you, you'll, you'll need to look at him very, very closely because he, he brought them under terrible conviction. Uh, you know they said you're speaking against the law. You are rejecting the law. You know what he said? He started, he, he appeared as if he was talking about their history. But you know, he told them that if you recollect very well, the children of Israel rejected the law of God while Moses was receiving that law at the hand of God. Right at the foot of Sinai, they broke the law of God. He said, you are accusing me of rejecting the law. Our fathers, the whole nation, the people of Israel, they rejected that law. While God was giving the law to Israel, they never kept it. They never kept it. Moses was busy on the mountain receiving the law at the hand of God and the people at that time they said we don't know what has happened to Moses are you saying I've rejected Moses our fathers rejected him at the most important time they rejected him while he went to take that law from the hand of God and before he came back to give them the law they were already in idolatry and all through their history they were just rejecting the law of God and you have rejected Moses too because you have rejected his greatest prophecy which he prophesied about the prophet that shall come like unto him in accepting Christ I am accepting Moses and accepting the greatest prophecy that Moses ever gave you are the criminals I am just following the revelation of the scriptures you know this Stephen it was just a wonderful thing look at it from verse 38 this is he which was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in the Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us. Now, before I go on, let me clear up the word church in verse 38. The word church. Because you, you see here the church in the wilderness, and you say, well, were the children of Israel a church? No. You see, the New Testament was written in Greek. And uh, the name for church... The Greek word for church is the same word for assembly. And it, it says there, ecclesia. This is he that was with the ecclesia in the wilderness. That ecclesia means called out. And they were called out of Egypt. In the Old Testament, that's the meaning of exodus. They were called out. They were removed out of Exodus and they came into the wilderness. But you know, when you say you, you are called out of Egypt, another name you can give that in Greek is Ecclesia. They called out congregation. Those who are called out from Egypt. Now you read it with that, you understand. They say, see, that was with the called out congregation in the wilderness. With the angel which spake to him in the Mount Sinai with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us to whom our fathers would not obey but thrust him from them and in their hearts they turned back again into Egypt have I rejected Moses not at all 
Have I rejected the law? Not at all. I have believed all the time that the law was given as lively oracles by the hand of angels unto Moses. I have always believed that it's a lively thing to serve a purpose for the children of Israel for the period, for the time it was to serve. And, um, but our fathers, the fathers that were defending, and our forefathers, they rejected the law. They rejected the word of God. And they turned back again into Egypt, saying unto Aaron, Make us gods to go before us. For as for this Moses, which brought us out of the land of Egypt, we know not, we wot not, what is become of him. And they made a call in those days and offered sacrifice unto the idol and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. And God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets, O ye house of Israel. Have ye offered to me slain beasts and sacrifices by the space of forty years in the wilderness? Ye, ye took up the tabernacle of Moloch, and the star of your god, Raphan, figures which ye made to worship them, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. He recounted their disobedience in their ears. He, saying, he was saying to them, Now you are sitting here to judge me, that I have rejected the law. But this law you are defending. This law you are saying, well, I'm rejecting. Our forefathers rejected it right at the foot of Sinai. With all that thunder, with all that, uh, all that lightning, with all the fear, with the quaking, with the trembling. While Moses went to take the law right at the foot of Sinai. They were already going back into idolatry. And they rose up to play. And they rose up to eat. And they were in the shame of their idolatry. Right there. And their hearts and their minds turned away. They turned back into Egypt. And so this law you are saying, they have never kept this law. They have never kept this word that had been given to them. Now in telling them, he was saying that they had a long history of disobedience against the law. He was telling them that they rejected God and they rejected the law for the major part of their history. And that if they were going to lay the blame on anybody for rejecting the law, they must lay it on the whole of Israel. And you know, even these Pharisees who are in the council, judging, um, judging Stephen, they themselves have rejected the law of God because they had compiled a, a, a book of oral law, their own laws, which they just spoke. But they had rejected the real written law of God, the word of God. And they made the real word of God of non effect by their traditions. And now he told them that they were just bad, evil. Now let me just show you one passage out of all that were written here. Exodus chapter 31 and chapter 32. Exodus, the last verse of chapter 31. Then, verse, then chapter 32. And he gave unto Moses, when he had made an end of communion with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, tables of stone, written with the finger of God. Look at the next verse. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods, we shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we what not, we know not what has become of him. The law had already been written completely on the two tables of stone, the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue, and had been given to the, into the hands of Moses. And it was just to go and declare that law to them. And just at that point, they rejected God and the law and Moses and turned away from the Lord. And so Stephen was telling them that this wasn't a new thing. It wasn't a strange thing. And in the Old Testament, the, the prophet said it over and over that these people had rejected the word. Now, he comes to the temple. You know, now, he had, he had already answered all the church team. Blasphemy against the law. 
and he has proved that he was not blaspheming against the law at all because he called that law lively oracles lively oracles but then he showed them that they were the people rejecting the law with the whole nation now how about the temple verse 44 of acts chapter 7 acts chapter 7 verse 44 our fathers had the tabernacle of will witness in the wilderness as he had appointed speaking unto Moses that he should make it according to the fashion that he had seen which also our fathers that came after brought in with Jesus into the um, possession of the Gentiles whom God drave out before the face of our fathers Unto the days of David. The word Jesus in that verse 45. If you look at the margin of your Bible. If it has a margin. You'll see it is Joshua. Because Joshua and Jesus. They have the same meaning. Joshua means Jehovah saves. And Jesus means God saves. The Lord our salvation. And so he was saying that concerning the temple. Uh, now let's go back to the time of the tabernacle with Moses. You know, always linking everything with Moses. He talked about God. He talked about Moses. He talked about the law. And he talked about the temple. And you know, he started telling them that he was not a blasphemer against God. After finishing that, he went into the life of Moses. But then he kept on linking God and Moses. And when he came to the law, he had not dropped his point number one, point number two. I told you last week, he was, talking, he was talking about the law now, but he was going to talk about God, Moses, and the law. Now he wants to talk about the tabernacle, and he's not going to drop his point one, two, and point three. He's going to talk about the temple, but at the same time, about God, Moses, the law, and the temple all together. Now, he goes back to the time of the tabernacle, and he says, Our fathers they had the tabernacle and uh, listen very well because they were accusing him that he didn't believe in the temple and he took them back to the time when the tabernacle was raised up and he said Moses did it according to the pattern or the fashion that was shown him which he had seen and when our fathers he said when they came into the he said the land or the possession of the gentiles the possession of the nations that's just a phraseology for the land of canaan when he came with joshua when god had driven out those people before their face until the days of david who found favor verse 46 before god and desired to find a tabernacle for the god of jacob but Solomon built him a house. Now, already now, he has shown the whole history. And already he has spanned, do you know, thousands of years. From the wilderness, to the settlement in Canaan, to the time of the judges, to the time of the kings. And he has already come into the time of Solomon. And he has said, well, the tabernacle was a temporary thing that you set up by the Levites and then you remove when you want to move out to another place. But then David had it in his mind that he will build a tabernacle, a, a temple, something permanent for the glory of the name of God. And God said, you will not build the temple for me. But Solomon will do it. And so he said in verse, four, in verse 47, but Solomon built him an house. Verse 48. How be it, the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as saith the prophet. Now, you see what Stephen is doing? Stephen is saying, I believe the tabernacle served a purpose in the wilderness. Of course it did, because it was built according to the fashion that was shown him in, uh, on the mountain. And I believe that the temple served a purpose at its time. But then he said, How be it, the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as says the prophet. Now, why did he say, as says the prophet? 
let me tell you. They accused him that he didn't believe in the tabernacle. He never came at any time to come and sacrifice at the tabernacle. How was this man praying? Because they believed that they must come to the tabernacle and they must pray. And if they were praying anywhere in the city, they must face in the direction of the tabernacle. And they never saw him doing that. They never saw him um, uh, praying in the, tab in the temple and, or praying towards the temple. Obviously, he does not believe in the temple. Oh, that's what they thought. And how is he able to make any contact with God, with the Most High? Doesn't he pray? Doesn't he call upon God? Then he said, the tabernacle was uh, reared up. The temple was built and now you may question why i don't always come to sacrifice and offer animal in the temple because jesus christ the lamp of god has been sacrificed for me and then you wonder how do i ever have contact with the most high then he said the most high dwelleth not in temples made with hands temples temples plural you know what he said Solomon built him a house. Where is it? Where is that house? Where is that house? It's already destroyed. Ezra, Nehemiah, built again. Where is it? Zerubbabel, built again. Where is it? And this one you are now in and you are saying, well, this one is very great. 46 years they were built in 70 AD. You will not find it again. Because... You cannot restrict deity. That's what you are trying to do. You are trying to box him up, corner him up, confine him somewhere. How be it, the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands. You know who said that first? Solomon himself. Second Chronicles. Chapter 2. Verse 1. Second Chronicles chapter 2 verse 1 And Solomon determined to build an house For the name of the Lord And an house for his kingdom Verse 5 And the house which I build is great For great is our God Above all gods Verse 6 But who is able to build him an house? Who is able to build him an house? Seeing the heaven and heaven of heavens cannot contain him. Who am I then that I shall build him an house, save only to burn sacrifice before him? You know, Solomon himself recognized this fact that you, you cannot confine the Almighty, the God of heaven, the Most High. And in Second Chronicles chapter 6, verse 1, Then said Solomon, The Lord has said that he will dwell in the thick darkness, but I have built an house of habitation for thee, a place for thy dwelling forever. Verse 18, But will God in very deed dwell with men on the earth? Behold, heaven, and the heaven of heavens, cannot contain thee how much less this house which i have built so he told them that well you're talking about the temple as if we we cannot worship at all without this temple you are staying in and you say this holy place this holy place this holy place what did solomon himself who built that temple at the first time what did he say and then he told them and in isaiah chapter 66 verses 1 and 2 Isaiah chapter 66 verses 1 and 2 Thus says the Lord the heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool where is the house that ye build unto me and where is the place of my rest for all those things as mine hand made and all those things have been says the Lord but to this man will I look even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit and trembleth at my word and so he told them according to what the prophets have said just this tabernacle or this temple cannot contain him and then in acts chapter 7 verse 49 heaven is my throne the earth is my footstool what house will ye build me says the lord says the lord or what is the place of my rest? Has not my hand made all these things? Now, Stephen had been convicting them. 
he had been talking to them about God, about Moses, about the law, and about the temple. But you know, as he came to his conclusion, to his climax, he now wanted them to give an account of their lives to God. He's talked about the fathers, he's talked about the patriarchs, he has talked about Joseph, he has talked about Moses, he has talked about Israel, he has talked about what happened thousands of years ago. Now, he wants to talk directly to them. Verse 51. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did so do ye. You say, can we preach like that? Can we just directly tell the people like that? Or is there a stage, a level of unction, a level of anointing, a part of heaven, a part of the heavenly thing, the nature that comes upon you before you can preach like that? Can we preach like that ordinarily and just say ye stiff necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears? Or it, will a person have to have his, or his heart already in heaven, his mind already in heaven, and everything about him already in heaven, only his feet touching the earth before we can preach that way? Well, come next Monday, I'll be telling you. The stage will reach when we can preach like that. This was his last message. Everything was said. Heavens were paying attention. The angels were watching. And Jesus Christ was ready. He was just doing the last. Now, not everybody will be preaching the last message every time. You know, I'm believing God that um, if Jesus tarries and... If you continue to pray for me, tonight is not my last message. You know that. And I believe that uh, as you go, you go on the bus, you go in the house fellowship, uh, you, you preach on Sunday, uh, on Sunday at the Sunday message. I'm believing that if Jesus tarries, you are not preaching the last message. You don't look too old. And you don't look as if uh, next time when you are going to preach uh, in the house fellowship or uh, on the street or wherever you are preaching, I don't think you'll be preaching the last message. But you know, Stephen was preaching the last message. The heart in heaven, the mind in heaven, Jesus Christ already waiting for him. And the angels, uh, you know, just standing at attention and the gates of heaven opening. And he must tell the people just what they needed to hear for the very last time. Now, you come next Monday, I'll be telling you the rest. We've learned so much about uh, Stephen, and it's so wonderful. What I want you to do today is to commit yourself to the study of the Word of God, that when the opportunity comes, you'll be so saturated with the Bible, with the Word of God, that when you open your mouth, like a reel, like a bundle of a thread, the thread of truth, everything will just be coming out of your mouth. And the people that hear, the Spirit of God will draw them, the power of God will draw them, and they'll come into the Lord. Rise up and let's talk to the Lord. Get nearer God. Pray more to the Lord. Surrender yourself to the Lord. You can be like that. You can be like that. The Spirit of God feeling you and saturating you. The Word of God feeling you and saturating you. The power of God, the anointing, the unction. Feeling and saturating you. You can be like that. And when somebody sees you on the job, in business, either praying or singing or preaching, the power of God will be coming out of you in great measure. It can happen. It can happen if you'll just talk to the Lord.